I was born upon the prairie, where the wind blew free and there was nothing to breathe but the light of the sun. I was born where there were no enclosures and where everything drew a free breath. I know every stream between the Rio Grande and the Arkansas. I have hunted and lived over that country. I lived like my fathers before me, and like them, I lived happily. Ten bears, Yamparica, Comanche. At the time of the European discovery of the New World, there may have been up to 10 million native inhabitants in North America, comprising more than 300 separate tribes. They're vastly different, different in appearance. Their languages are different, their, their dress was different. Uh, their religions were different. And people must remember that an Indian in the Southwest is not an Indian in the Northwest or in, in the East, and the Western Indians were vastly different. Incredibly, by the end of the Civil War, the Native American population had dwindled to less than half a million. Despite the assumption that uh, wars and warfare knocked out most of the Indian population, uh, act, in actual fact, uh, an awful lot of Indians died from disease that was brought by the whites. Give them smallpox or measles or something like that, and it would just spread like wildfire and hit tribes that never even had yet seen a white man and didn't know what was happening to them. The struggle for survival was difficult, but the Native Americans of the Western frontier had adapted for centuries. The Hopi, Zuni, Akama, and other tribes of the Southwest raised corn in the desert. Shelter from the heat was provided by thick-walled pueblos. Others, like the Paiutes and the Shoshone west of the Rocky Mountains, combined hunting and gathering wild foods. The horse allowed the tribes of the Great Plains, the Cheyenne, the Comanche, the Kiowa, the Sioux, to range great distances to trade and follow the herds of buffalo. The Comanches in particular were renowned for their horsemanship. Juana Parker, war leader of the Quahati Comanches had an almost magical relationship with his horse. There were times whenever he would breathe into a horse's nostrils and that horse would get his scent. But at the same time, it was a manner of respecting that horse and that animal, and it was a mutual understanding there. And before too long, they had a respect for one another. But it was the teepee that came to symbolize the lifestyle of the Plains Indian. A long time ago, when they built the teepees, some kind of leader tells the people where to camp. They construct the teepee so the door is facing east because the cold wind blows from the north and northwest. Because the warmth comes from the east, they built their teepees facing east, and also the wind won't blow the teepee down. Each Indian culture produced a rich history of its people. Visual images carved in stone, called petroglyphs, and pictographs, drawings on hides. The rituals and legends were passed down orally by the elders from one generation to the next. My mother taught me the legends of our people taught me of the sun and sky, the moon and stars, the clouds and storms. She also taught me to kneel and pray to Yusin for strength, health, wisdom, and protection. Geronimo, Chiricahua Apache. Geronimo's mother taught him well. He defended his beliefs for 30 years and became the most famous Apache in history. Indian children were the promise of the future. Nancy Horncloud still remembers the old ways. 
a Azimui Chakya. A long time ago, when a child is first born, it is breastfed and spoken to as the mother feeds it. It is told many things, even though they don't understand. They are raised in that manner. They reach the age of four or five years and are still nursed and spoken to. They never scold them. They just talk to them. Indian children were cherished. They often rested in the security of a cradle board, diapered with moss and soft deer skin, and powdered with ground earth and buffalo chips. Our children are very carefully taught to be good. Their parents tell them stories, traditions of old times, even of the first mother of the human race, and love stories and fables. Sarah Winnemucca. Sarah Winnemucca, a northern Paiute, was called Shellflower by her people. A lifelong Indian activist, her autobiographical account of Paiute life was the first book written in English by a Native American woman. Oh, with what eagerness we girls used to watch every spring for the time when we could meet with our heart's delight, the young men whom in civilized life you call bows. We would all go in company to see if the flowers we were named for were yet in bloom. For almost all the girls are named for flowers. Courtship was difficult under the watchful eyes of the elders, and marriage was often by arrangement. To take a wife, a man needed more than good intentions. In his autobiography, Story of My Life, Geronimo recalled his struggle to marry a young maiden. Being 17 years of age, I was admitted to the Council of Warriors. Perhaps the greatest joy to me was that now I could marry the fair Alope. I went to see her father. He asked many ponies for her. I made no reply, but in a few days appeared before his lodge with the herd of ponies and took with me Alope. Tribes used rituals to bond their members together. Although tribal customs and religious beliefs varied, dreams and visions were seen as prophetic links to the future. A long time ago, my father told me what his father told him, that there was once a Lakota holy man called Drinkswater who dreamed what was to be long before the coming of the Washichus. He dreamt that a strange race had woven a spider's web all around the Lakotas, and he said, when this happens, you shall live in square gray houses in a barren land, and beside those square gray houses, you shall starve. Black Elk, Lakota Sioux. By the mid-19th century, the tribes were losing their ancestral lands to white settlement. Opposing views about the land would become the focus of conflict in the Wild West. The mountains and hills that you see are your backbone. And the gullies and the creeks which are between the hills and mountains are your heart veins. You follow Harjo, the creek of the Muskogee Nation. Common to all the tribal cultures was the strong belief that the earth was both mother and provider. The land itself was seen as one of earth's treasures to be shared by all. I feel pretty strongly that they worshiped the land. I don't mean that they bowed to it or anything. Worshiped it in the sense that they knew that the land was, was what the great one gave us for us to live on, see? The white man grows jealous of his red brother. The white man once came to trade. He now comes as a soldier. He once put his trust in our friendship and wanted no shield but our fidelity. He now covers his face with a cloud of jealousy and anger and tells us to be gone as an offended master speaks to his dog, Satank Kaiowa. Indian people for thousands of years had developed a, a mentality of being generous and sharing and, and living in a cooperative tribal society. Where on the other hand, Europeans for, for thousands of years had developed a mentality of take, take, take. Those kinds of ideologies just met 
head on in the plains. Settlers were surging westward, looking for a piece of the land to homestead for a better life or to gain the riches that could be mined from it. Many viewed that settlement of the frontier as America's rightful destiny. It is time for our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by Providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. John L. O'Sullivan, editor, New York Morning News. Manifest destiny was a slogan coined by a New York editor to justify territorial conquest. It was biblically inspired, and so therefore it is very easy uh, to uh, conquer and exploit a territory um, when God tells you to. Confrontations were inevitable. One of the great causes of clashes between whites and Indians west of the Mississippi was the fact that uh, Indian tribes had been brought to the point of starvation by the influx of white people. Uh, for, uh, the travelers, for instance, going west along the trails uh, hunted all the animals away or drove them away. So they had to find food any place they could, and a lot of them would go after covered wagon trains, and the whites usually just turned them away. They were scared of the Indians. And then the Indian would attack during the night, not to kill people, but to get food. But fighting would break out, and they were called Indian depredations. Settlers' fears turned to hatred. In Nevada, Sarah Winnemucca witnessed a campaign of decimation against her people. Reports were made everywhere by the white settlers that the Red Devils were killing their cattle. And by this lying, the trial began, which is marked by the blood of my people from hill to hill and from valley to valley. One of the things that we saw from, from a Lakota perspective was the people coming into the plains had either a, a very intense fear or a very int intense hatred of Lakota people. And the concept of the only good Indian is a dead Indian became the policy of, of people coming across the plains. Private citizens formed militias and attacked Indian tribes from California to Colorado. Damn any man who sympathizes with the Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill Indians. Colonel John Shivington, 3rd Colorado Volunteers. The event that intensified confrontations between the Indians and white people occurred at Sand Creek, Colorado Territory. Colonel John Shivington, a fanatic Indian hater, led 1,000 volunteers against the peaceful Cheyenne encampment of Chief Black Kettle. George Bent, the son of a Cheyenne woman and a white trader, was awakened along with his wife as the attack took place. When the soldiers first appeared, black cattle and white antelope would not believe that an attack was about to be made. Both of them had been to Washington and were friends of the whites. These two chiefs called to their people not to be afraid. But while they were still trying to quiet the frightened women and children, the soldiers opened fire. George Bent was badly wounded. More than 150 Cheyenne men, women, and children were killed. Whether or not the new Americans believed it was their divine right to conquer the West, they kept on coming, and the government adopted policies to deal with the Native Americans. The federal policy, if you could say what it was, give the Indian three choices. One, you either turn into a white man and get rid of your medicine man and you become Christians and cut your hair and live in white men's uh, type houses and so forth. Or we'll push you away so you can't infect us with your ideas, you can't hurt us. And uh, that worked as long as there was land to push them into in the West before whites went out there. The third was, if you don't want either of those two things, then we'll just exterminate you. Not all tribes had a tradition of warfare, but many Indians had lived in conflict with one another long before the coming of the white man. They fought over hunting lands and horses to protect their women and children and for personal honor. When our enemies were not bothering us, our warriors were bothering them. 
so there was always fighting going on somewhere. We women sometimes tried to keep our men from going to war, but this was like talking to winter winds. Pretty Shield, Crow Medicine Woman. Named for a fiery meteor that showered the northern plains, Sioux leader Red Cloud was an aggressive defender of his ancestral homeland. The white men have crowded the Indians back year by year. And now our last hunting ground, the home of the people, is to be taken from us. Our women and children will starve. But for my part, I prefer to die fighting. Red Cloud, Lakota Sioux. Indian warriors turned their fighting prowess against the intruders from the east. The white men would encounter very worthy foes in the Wild West. What voice was first sounded on this land? The voice of the red people who had but bows and arrows. What has been done in my country I did not want. When the white man comes in my country, he leaves a trail of blood. Red Cloud, Lakota Sioux. Just as Indian and white beliefs over the land were fundamentally different, so were their ideas of battle and honor. Young men began at a very early age preparing to become warriors because it was the highest status. And so the training as, as a young adult would include things like learning how to defend oneself and, and learning the concept of bravery. Going into battle had its own unique set of customs and rituals. War paint was not mere display, but was a sacred charm employed to protect the warrior from wounds and death. A medicine man instructed our party in the proper manner of putting on the paint. George Bent, Cheyenne. It was essential that we have a warrior society. We needed a warrior society because we needed protection. We had to survive. And uh, the, the beating of the drum assimilates the, the warriors in battle as they advance and they crouch and they zigzag, and uh, that's what the beat of the drum is. This victory song was sung by White Bear when he rode off to battle, and it was passed on to Frank Cobbin by his grandfather. It wasn't the primary purpose of the battle to kill people. It was to breach out and count coup. You had this long stick, and when you entered into battle, you tried to get close enough to your enemy to reach out with that stick and hit them with that stick or drag them off their horse. And this was the most honorable thing to do if you were a Lakota warrior. Sitting Bull, a Hunkpapa Sioux, counted his first coup or victory against a Crow warrior at the age of 14. He earned numerous honors stealing the horses of his enemy. Each eagle feather in a war bonnet represented a coup counted, an honor won. But Sioux warrior leader Red Cloud realized the rules of battle must change. Only by killing the white enemy would his people be saved. The great father sent his soldiers out here to spill blood. But I did not first commence the spilling of blood. If they disturb me, there will be no peace. What I have said, I mean. I mean to keep this land. When gold was discovered in Montana Territory, the shortest route to striking it rich was the Bozeman Trail, but it cut right through the Sioux hunting grounds. Disregarding treaty obligations, the Army began building three forts along the trail to protect the miners. Great Father sends us presents and wants a new road, but White Chief goes with soldiers to steal the road before Indians say yes or no. Red Cloud, Lakota Sioux. Cocky young Army officer Lieutenant William J. Fetterman boasted that he needed only 80 men to take all of Sioux country. Lured into a trap by Red Cloud and his warriors, Fetterman and his troops were wiped out. Assisted by Cheyenne and Arapaho warriors, Red Cloud and the Sioux surrounded the forts 
and virtually closed the Bozeman Trail. Cut off from supplies, the miners and soldiers faced starvation. Red Cloud was a brilliant uh, military strategist, but I think even more importantly, he was a political genius. H.B. Denman reported back to Washington. Red Cloud sent us word that his war against the whites was to save the Valley of the Powder River, the only hunting ground left to his nation, from our intrusion. He assured us that whenever the military garrisons at Fort Phil Kearney and Fort C.F. Smith were abandoned, the war on his part would cease. In a surprising move, a government peace commission agreed to Red Cloud's terms, and the army abandoned the Bozeman Trail. Red Cloud had won his war. We have to, to remember that this man is the only man in the history of the United States to win a war with the United States government and, and have the government come to his terms. Red Cloud signed the treaty that established a reservation for the Sioux. A couple of years after Red Cloud signed the Treaty of 1868, he went to Washington, D.C. There was an interpretation done of, of the treaty, and at that point, he was astonished to hear some of the things that, that, were, that he thought were in the treaty were no longer there, and he became outraged. Angered over these discrepancies in the treaty, Red Cloud became a warrior with words and appealed to Eastern reformers. The reports you hear concerning us are all on one side. We have given you nearly all of our lands. And if we had any more land to give, we would be very glad to give it. We have nothing more. We want to raise our children and make them happy and prosperous. We ask you to help us. Although Red Cloud's oratory moved the nation, his struggle with the U.S. government was not over. Well, Red Cloud is staying on the reservation. He's trying to control the people, and he's advocating that they, they have a, a peaceful relationship with the United States government. At the same time, the United States government is not following through with their obligations from the Treaty of 1868. Provisions that were called for commodities and food to be delivered to the tribes are not being delivered. Some of the people are starving, and the people are becoming very um, upset. The white people have put bad medicine over Red Cloud's eyes to make him see anything and everything they please. Sitting Bull, Hunkpapa Sioux. Sitting Bull and other Indian leaders left the reservation for the sacred Black Hills in Dakota Territory to escape the influence of white settlement. But in 1875, gold was discovered in the Black Hills and a government commission was sent to lease or buy back that territory from the Indians. The Sioux refused. What treaty that the whites have kept has the red man broken? Not one. What treaty that the whites ever made with us red men have they kept? Not one. Sitting Bull, Hunkpa Pa Sioux. In the centennial year of 1876, the army mounted a full-scale campaign to defeat the tribes of the Northern Plains once and for all. Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer underestimated soldiers. Custer divided his force of 600 to entrap a village protected by 2,000 warriors. Reno's battalion started down the valley, first on a trot, then at a gallop, marching in columns of twos. A very brave young officer in command of the scouts rode ahead. He swung his hat around in the air, and he sung out to them, 30 days furlough to the man who gets the first scalp. Which brings us to that portentous question on which history has hung breathless for more than a century. At what point did Custer, with Indians to the front, Indians to the left, Indians to the right, and Indians to the rear, at what point did he look around and say, oh, shit? Custer and 210 men of the 7th Cavalry were trapped and destroyed. Henry Bailey was among the dead. This battle wrecked the lives of 26 women at Fort Lincoln, and orphaned children joined the cry of their bereaved mothers. God asked them to walk on alone, in the shadow. Libby Custer. Dear Mother, but it lasted less than an hour. 
These men that came with the long hair were as good of men as ever fought. When they rode up, their horses were tired, and they were tired. When they got off from their horses, they swayed like the limbs of cypresses in a strong wind. Sitting Bull, Hunk Papa Su. 200 soldiers, along with their commander, George Custer, were wiped out. The victorious Indians would call this the Battle of Greasy Grass. White men called it Custer's Last Stand. The battle at Greasy Grass proved a bittersweet victory for the Indians of the Northern Plains. Sitting Bull led his people across the border into exile in Canada to escape the wrath of the U.S. Army. The struggle now fell on the Southern Plains. Here, the Wild West was about to experience its next confrontation. Tell the white chiefs that the Coates are warriors and will surrender when the blue coats come and whip us. Quanah Parker, Comanche. Treaties signed at Medicine Lodge, Kansas, promised goods and annuities to the Southern Plains tribes in exchange for staying off the warpath and moving on to reservation lands. However, not every tribe signed the treaties. Comanche Quanah Parker believed the treaties to be meaningless and continued to fight. Quanah's defiance began at the age of 14 when his mother was kidnapped by Texas Rangers. Before the death of my father, he told me that my mother was a white woman, that he took her into captivity from Central Texas when she was a child. There was born to her three children, myself being the oldest, a brother named Peanuts, and a sister who was an infant when she was captured. Now, Quanah and his band stepped up their raids upon the white men. President Grant believed all free-roaming Indians, peaceful or hostile, should be confined. By destroying the great buffalo herds, white hunters would make the Indians dependent on government food allotments and force them to move onto the reservations. White hunters assist the advance of civilization by destroying the Indians' commissary. For the sake of lasting peace, let them kill, skin, and sell until they have exterminated the buffalo. General Philip Sheridan. Professional buffalo hunters descended upon the plains. The Washichus did not kill them to eat. They took only the hides to sell, and sometimes only the tongues. And sometimes they did not even take the tongues. They just killed and killed because they liked to do that. Black elk, Lakota Sioux. Over three and a half million buffalo were killed in the brief two years between 1872 and 1874. The Native Americans' free-roaming way of life was fast disappearing. Angered over the slaughter of buffalo, Quanah Parker and the Comanches, along with over 700 Kiowa, Cheyenne, and Arapaho warriors, sought to drive out the buffalo hunters. In a pre-dawn attack, Quana and his warriors swept down on the encampment of buffalo hunters at Adobe Walls, Texas. The battle was recorded on this hide painting. We charged pretty fast on our horses, throwing up dust. I see men and horses roll over and over. We killed two white men in a wagon. I got shot in the side. The white men had big guns that killed a mile away. Quana Parker. The Indians' bravery was no match for the buffalo hunters' long-range weapons, which inflicted heavy casualties. Quanah retreated from adobe walls, but continued his raids along with bands of Kiowa and Cheyenne. To end the attacks, troops from all parts of the frontier converged onto the southern plains. Because the army had a great deal more than they had available in the way of uh, guns and whatever. And rather than have them wiped out entirely, there was, there was, he felt like that this is, this is time for us to, in a sense, join hands with them and maybe be able to, we can retain some things that are ours. Quana and his Comanches came in of their own accord at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. His wife, Wickia, and family were with him. At the fort, Quana learned the fate of his mother, taken from him years ago. 
Abducted by the Texas Rangers, Cynthia Ann Parker was reunited with her white relatives, but died of a broken heart, longing for her son and her Comanche family. Looking to the future, Kwana set aside his hatred of the white men and began a remarkable transition from warrior to peaceful leader.